Okay. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Good to see so many of your faces. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'll kick us off now that we're officially at the top of the hour. So welcome, everyone. My name is Sophie Block. I'm the director of Hillel's of Memphis, and I am so excited for today's lecture, um, part of our On One Foot virtual lecture series that features a different Jewish faculty member from our incredible local um, academic institutions here each month um, for the entire Memphis Jewish community to enjoy. So thank you community members and thank you students for tuning in. Um, this week's lecture is Professor Sarah Ift Decker, and um, I'm so excited for her topic. We've never had a topic like this, so I'm really excited for the wisdom and knowledge that you're going to bring us. Um, a little intro about Professor Ift Decker is that she teaches a wide array of courses on the global Middle Ages, many of which encompass both Europe and, Middle e and the Middle East, and also incorporate the lived experiences of the Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Through her teaching, she seeks to expose students to the diverse experiences of people of different ethnicities, religions, and genders in the medieval world. She grew up in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C., and has lived in many places like uh, Pennsylvania and New York and Connecticut and Indiana before coming here to Memphis in the summer of 2022. So thank you, Professor If Decker, for being here, and I will officially pass the mic over to you. All right, so first of all, thank you so much, Sophie, for your introduction, and thank you all for being here today. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some material coming out of my own research, so I'll also give a little bit of information about what that research process is like and about some of what the, uh, the background is in terms of this particular environment that I'm going to be looking at uh, geographically and culturally speaking. So... Moving fast forward already. On November 11th, 1293, a Jewish woman named Reina extended her first loan, or at least the first for which documentation still survives. And one of the things that was really fascinating about my research is being able to uncover the uh, uh, that this woman, who's just an ordinary person, not particularly famous, not particularly important, is somebody who has a really intriguing life story that I can find out more about in through my variety of documentation. So the contracts you see here, which are from a few years later in Terena's career, can be found in a small archive in a town called Vic in the region of Catalonia, so in the northeast of what's now Spain. I lived in Vic for three months in early 2015, working in this archive every day except for Sunday when it was closed. And spending three months in Vic was a really interesting experience, in part because it gave me the chance to live and work fully immersed in the Catalan language in a town where pretty much nobody spoke English well and nobody wanted to speak Spanish for political reasons, uh, if anybody is familiar with the Catalan independence movement. But it was also an interesting experience because I was able to develop a really intense familiarity with the treasure trove of documents recording the lives and work of Jewish women over 700 years ago. While I was in Vic, I learned far more than I initially expected to about Reina's personal life and career. She was born in Vic to a prominent local family. Both her father, Bon Masip, and her mother, who was also named Reina, also worked as moneylenders. Her great aunt Gutsch and her grandmother, who was uh, yet another Reina, you'll, uh, you'll see this is a constant theme, is that people were not very creative with names in the 13th and 14th centuries, uh, that these women had been among the most important founding members of the town's Jewish community. When Reina was probably in her late teens, she left the city to marry a man named Yusuf Darahi in the much larger neighboring city of Barcelona. But the marriage ended in divorce within a decade. We don't know if the problem lay in the fact that the couple never had children or in Joseph's documented gambling problem or something else entirely. But what we do know is that when she moved back to her hometown, she established a career as a moneylender, which would last almost 20 years. She also remarried. And while she again found a husband who came from outside of her own small community, this time her husband moved to Vic, 
Her new husband, Astrid Kadavida, came from the city of Girona, uh, a city very well known for its Jewish community. In Vic, he established his own career as a moneylender. The other thing which I found really interesting is that only a year after her marriage did Reina start to describe herself in documents as being Astrid's wife, uh, rather than as her father Bon Masif's daughter, perhaps the equivalent of a woman keeping her maiden name for professional reasons. The other interesting thing is that's really struck me is that when we add up all of Reina's and Astrid's loans and at least kind of see what we can surmise about what the income was based on the interest they charged, it looks like Reina contributed about 40% of the couple's household income from money lending, which is actually not so different from what we see uh, for women's contribution to family earnings in the late 20th century and early 21st. As a historian of medieval women and gender, I come across a lot of popular assumptions about women in the medieval past. Uh, and so this is very much uh, come up in the context of uh, the book that I uh, have finished up and have coming out in September on Jewish and Christian women's work in this area. And one question I've been asked multiple times by people when I mention the subject of my book is, did women work in the Middle Ages? And this question reveals a really common myth about the medieval past, that medieval Europe was such a fully and completely patriarchal society that women had no legal rights, no ability to work outside the home, and no remedy against their near constant oppression. In reality, women's lived experience of misogyny differed in kind, not just in degree, that the Middle Ages isn't just a worse version of what things might look like today. Linear narratives also tend to usually not get history quite right. There are more continuities in women's experiences from the Middle Ages to today than we might be comfortable admitting. Uh, for example, this is an example uh, not from Jewish history specifically, but if we look at England in the 14th century, the pay gap between women and men doing the same work is almost exactly the same as it is in the United States today. And as I talk today, we'll demonstrate, we do see Jewish women working in areas, including the management of financial resources and the production of textiles, and using Jewish and Christian legal institutions to protect their claims over family assets. Nor were Jewish women unique in this respect. The other assumption that I've encountered often is the idea that Jewish women were perhaps unusually active or savvy in business. As the traditional narrative often goes, Jewish women built and managed businesses and supported their families while their husbands devoted themselves to the study of Torah. And this story isn't wrong exactly, but it's a pretty significant oversimplification. First, while there were Jewish families in which wives worked in business, in business while their husbands studied and taught Torah, the assumption that women would take on the role of breadwinners was a choice, not a necessity. It was also a choice seen far more frequently in Ashkenaz, in the Jewish communities centered on Northern France and what is now Germany, than in Sepharad, the Jewish communities of what is now Spain. In Northern Europe, moreover, these Jewish women aren't unique. They would have encountered Christian women doing very similar kinds of work. The division of labor seen in these families, therefore, was not something uniquely Jewish that was required by the high value placed on education and Torah study, but a reflection of expectations around gender and labor that cross religious lines. In Sepharad, in contrast, we will see today many examples of women who worked and whose work was documented in ways that remain accessible to historians today. But it's also important to remember that these women are only a small minority of Jewish women. Most of the Jewish women of Sepharad, if they did work outside the home, worked in ways that were often low paid and that were considered low status and that rarely become visible in the documentary record from so many centuries ago. The documents that we do have, however, craft a rich picture of what might have been possible for at least some Jewish women and raise intriguing questions about what other kinds of work Jewish women may have been doing behind the scenes. So before we get into some of the details of the work performed by Jewish women in medieval Sepharad, I want to also provide a bit of context. Uh, so first of all, Spain is not a meaningful political entity for most of the Middle Ages. So I'm going to do a kind of whirlwind tour of the history of the region that geographically speaking is referred to as the Iberian Peninsula. So if we go all the way back to about the year 600, what is today Spain and Portugal are under the rule of a group called the Visigoths, who are perhaps best known for being the group of Germanic tribes who sacked the city of Rome in the year 410. 
Scholars of Jewish history often also remember the Visigoths as early adopters of policies that attempted to forcibly convert Jews to Christianity. By the time they did this, however, the Visigoths were relatively weak and their authority was constantly undermined by factionalism. So most historians now think that these forced conversions had little impact in practice, basically that everybody basically said kind of that's nice, we're not doing that. Nevertheless, the apparent hostility of some Visigothic rulers toward the Jews probably explains why they seem to have enthusiastically accepted uh, the Muslim takeover in the year 711. Uh, Muslim rulers in the Middle East and North Africa often tolerated Christians and Jews, albeit with certain restrictions that were designed to create and reinforce religious hierarchies. Some people even speak of a golden age under Muslim rule in the area that became known as Al-Andalus. And so this concept is one that's somewhat exaggerated, but we can certainly say that Jews, or at least elite Jewish men, are afforded a lot of opportunities not necessarily available to Jews elsewhere. And that this Jewish community experienced a pretty high degree of security until some changes in about the 12th century. Uh, at which point a new dynasty comes into town and takes a more restrictive attitude. And many Jews then end up relocating to other kingdoms in the Iberian Peninsula, often kingdoms under Christian rule. So by, the, by this period, so as we kind of move into about the 12th century, uh, we see a deeply divided Iberian Peninsula, divvied up into numerous kingdoms, some Christian, some Muslim, pretty much all with Jewish inhabitants. By the middle of the 13th century, the vast majority of the populate of the peninsula is under Christian rule, divided between the Christian kingdoms of Castile, the kind of big one in pink, uh, Aragon, which is uh, smaller geographically, but uh, has a perhaps higher population and is wealthier, uh, and then Portugal and Navarre. Uh, and then there's only a single Muslim kingdom remaining at this point, the Southern Emirate of Granada, until, uh, which will persist until about the, the end of the 15th century. Uh, so just as a kind of whirlwind tour to bring you to where we're at in the mid 13th and mid 14th century. Uh, and the one other thing that I will note in terms of uh, the kind of traditional narrative here is that Historians used to describe the shifting balance of power in the Iberian Peninsula, you know, from Muslims to Christians, with this term Reconquista, which literally means reconquest. Although Christians thought of these uh, wars as restoring rightful Christian rule to the region, historians today tend to treat this idea with more skepticism. Um, after all, by the time that Christians began to make significant incursions into formerly Muslim ruled territories, these places had been under Muslim rule for about for almost 400 years. If Queen Elizabeth arrived today, about 250 years after the American Declaration of Independence and announced that she was reconquering the United States, we probably contest that choice of terms. And certainly many people have recently challenged the, Russian, the Russians' recent justification of the war against Ukraine as a restoration of earlier borders. The Jews living in the Iberian Peninsula, however, don't seem to have been particularly concerned one way or the other with these theoretical justifications. What mattered to them it was whether particular rulers, be they Christian or Muslim, were committed to tolerating and protecting Jewish communities. In the early era of the Christian conquests, Christian rulers were very much willing overall to do so. Uh, in some cities and towns, they even offered very generous privileges, granting Jews the right of self-governance and protecting them from possible Christian bias and courts of law. This generosity was due to pragmatism, not ethics. As they settled new territories, they hoped to populate them with inhabitants and in particular non-Muslim inhabitants, including Jews as well as Christians. Moreover, privileges always came with restrictions. Religious identity determined a person's legal status, and both Christian and Muslim rulers worked to shape religious hierarchies that subordinated people of other faiths. So I provided this very simplified overview for those of you who might not be familiar with this broader context, but as I move into talking about some of the particularities of Jewish women's work, I'm also going to be focusing on a much narrower and more specific place and time within the broader context of Sepharad or the Iberian Peninsula, the region of Catalonia. So this is part of that Kingdom of Aragon, uh, and I'm looking mostly at the 13th and 14th centuries. There are some other kind of important developments uh, in terms of changes in the late 14th and into the 15th century, including, of course, most famously the expulsion from Spain. Uh, but I'm not going to be quite getting into that today. 
Although the overview that I provided suggested some commonalities and experiences of Jews across Sepharad, in reality, many aspects of Jewish society and culture differ even between cities and towns. So we should therefore not be particularly surprised to hear that there are also important differences in Jewish experiences between kingdoms with distinct languages and cultures. Given both these regional differences and the practical challenges of conducting on-site research abroad, we historians often tend to focus somewhat more narrowly. So most scholars of Jews in medieval Sepharad tend to focus on either Castile or Aragon or Al-Andalus, uh, Muslim Al-Andalus, and not on everything. Uh, so the region that I'm going to be looking at today is one that has an especially rich documentation of the everyday realities of women's work. So in my research, I work mostly with a type of sources known as notarial registers. Notaries, so you, you still might go to a notary today to uh, kind of formally uh, you know, sign or kind of stamp your document. Uh, but in this period, notaries are also legal professionals who are trained in drawing up valid contracts that would be written in Latin. They also do have this function as well as public officials, so meaning that their involvement is what turned a private business arrangement into a legal fact that could be enforced in a court of law. Not just anyone can become a notary. You need specialized training to be able to do this. Uh, you know, not everybody even necessarily knows Latin, much less has learned these forms of what makes a valid contract. Uh, you also needed to be a man. The a notary was not the notariat or this profession was not open to women. Uh, you needed to be a Christian. This, uh, this profession was also not open to Jews or to Muslims. Uh, and you had to be a citizen of the city where you sought appointment as a notary. Notaries drew up copies of contracts on parchment, so made from animal skin, for their clients, who often would keep them in special chests and would value them as material representations of immaterial or immovable assets. But notaries also kept copies of these contracts for their own records. And that's what you're going to be seeing uh, here over here on the side and in the, uh, the closed form over here. So these copies are written in abbreviated form, uh, often in uh, less than your, their best handwriting. You might be able to kind of tell that in some of the examples we'll look at up a bit closer. Uh, and uh, we and they're written in these bound paper books. Uh, so these are actually some of the oops, uh, some of the earliest examples of documents uh, written in Western Europe on paper. Uh, so different kinds of contracts would take up more space than others. Uh, a complicated marriage contract or a real estate sale might, feel, might fill up several pages, but a notary could fit maybe three or four simple loan contracts on a single page. So uh, something like this, right? But these are actually four separate contracts. They also, for their records, would draw these uh, lines or hatch marks through them which indicates essentially that the transaction has been completed. So in these cases that the loan has been repaid. Uh, so in each individual, one of these books uh, known as a register contains hundreds of these individual contracts. And I spent about a year working every day, reading through registers uh, in archives. Uh, my, my favorite one of these is uh, in the city of Barcelona. Um, uh, so, and this is the Anchu Capitular, and it's actually located on top of the cloisters of the cathedral. Uh, so it's fun, you get, you know, you go in basically through the regular entrance, and then you have to fight through the crowds of tourists to get into this ricky little, uh, rickety little elevator and convince the tourists that no, you're not allowed to come up the elevator with me into the archive. Uh, so during this year, as well as a few subsequent research trips, I consulted about 100 registers each in three different cities. So Barcelona here, Vic, which I mentioned before, and Girona, which is another city known for having a really substantial Jewish community in this region. Uh, so and I had, you know, this, you know, about uh, 300 registers that I kind of looked through in detail and looked at all of these contracts. And that's actually only a tiny fraction of what's available the sheer volume of surviving documentation means that even though Jewish women only appear in a pretty small percentage of contracts, I still have about 2000 documents that can directly illuminate the lives and work of medieval Jewish women. As valuable as these sources are, they don't tell us everything. And in a few minutes, I'll discuss some of the work that was performed by women that might be invisible or underrepresented in these documents. But I want to start off by discussing an especially well-documented form of work, 
undertaken by some women in wealthier families, the management of personal and family assets. The bulk of notarial documentation tends to record things like credit, investment, and commercial ventures in the buying and selling of real estate. First and foremost, a business like this is well documented because it benefited from contracts. If you extended either a personal or a business loan, you wanted a record of it to make sure that the person would eventually pay you back. If you borrowed money, you'd want a contract that clearly stated, you know, what you owed, if you had to pay interest, etc. Jewish loans to Christians are especially well documented in these records because Jews were legally required to register their loans with Christian notaries. So the high volume of documentation of Jewish work and credit, combined with a lot of very nasty Christian rhetoric about linking money with Jews and treating Jews as greedy, has helped give rise to the popular myth that money lending is the only trade open to Jews and that Jews are the only people working in it. In reality, Christians always worked alongside Jews as money lenders and Jews practiced a wide array of professions. But I will be devoting a lot of discussion to credit because of this high volume of documentation, which also means that it's the kind of work for which I can easily compare Jewish women with Jewish men and with Christian women. The overall broad impression that we get from these sources is that Jewish women extended a pretty small fraction of Jewish loans. Uh, and in fact, actually, that Christian women played a more prominent role than their Jewish counterparts in local credit markets. Uh, so this is kind of by percentage, the percentage of Jewish loans extended by Jewish women versus that of Christian loans extended by Christian women. However, both the case studies that I'm able to do of individual women who I can track over a number of years, as well as quantitative studies, so the things that you know, produce for graphs like these, reveal some intriguing exceptions to the general pattern. The case of Bonadona, widow of Astrid Cadavida of Girona, allows us to explore why some individual women took on a more active role than others in managing family wealth. And before I get into this particular case, this is a completely different Astrid Caravita from the Astrid Caravita that I mentioned before, is what it is with uh, the main issue. Bonadona only briefly appeared in the sources before her husband's death in 1334. At that point, however, her husband made an interesting and apparently unusual choice. He had a contract drawn up in Hebrew, which gave his wife all the debts owed to him and all his goods. In other words, he effectively made her his heir. We don't have this contract, but we know about it because she referred to it many, many times in these Latin contracts. So that, uh, so technically, according to Jewish law, husbands are not supposed to select their wives as their heirs, but in this particular case, Ostrog decided to basically do so anyway. And this suggests that he probably assumed that his wife could effectively manage his estate after his death. And this in turn could suggest the possibility that she was doing similar kinds of work behind the scenes uh, already during her marriage. So if Jewish women are performing tasks like keeping household account books, giving business advice, helping to connect their husbands with debtors looking for loans, work like that probably wouldn't appear in the kinds of sources that have survived, but might have influenced some men to leave the management of estates to their wives. However, given that Bonadona appears much more frequently than most widows, we have to wonder if she was somehow exceptional, either in her family circumstances or in her husband's trust in her skills. Another intriguing part of this story is that even within the region, different local Jewish communities might make distinct choices about the role that women could play in managing family assets. Uh, and so as you'll remember from before, the uh, Reina who is married to the other, Astrid Caravida, uh, has this very long and successful career that I talked about. And one of the things that was so fascinating as I was looking at the documentation in this, you know, relatively small town of Vik, which is uh, not one that has been uh, quite as fully mined by other historians, uh, perhaps because they don't necessarily want to spend three months in Vik. Um, it, it has this really intriguing difference from a lot of other cities. And basically what that is, is that in Vik, Reina wasn't really that exceptional. There's about a dozen other married Jewish women who appear regularly in the notarial documentation, making loans to Christians from the town and the surrounding rural area. Gotch, wife of David Canviador, who was Reina's great aunt, had dominated the town's credit market in the 1250s and 1260s. She appears by far more than any other individual lender. 
women's share of the credit market is very then high in the 50s and in the 50s and especially in the 60s and does then decline, but remains pretty high for the region uh, all the way into uh, the kind of 1320s, about the 1320s. Uh, so that it ranges in the kind of 10 to 15 percent area, whereas it's more like 2 percent in most other places. And so this evidence suggests that in Vic, families expected that husbands and wives might both work as creditors and work together to manage and increase household wealth. And again, we don't know exactly why. Uh, did the Jewish community's early efforts to establish this foothold in this new hometown require more flexibility than usual? Uh, is there, are they kind of looking back at this particularly successful woman as saying like, we can do that in our families too. We can't say for certain, but this does offer this intriguing uh, example of what could be possible. Uh, so I have one final example related to credit to discuss before moving on to some other forms of work. People in the Middle Ages uh, also, of course, confronted a major pandemic, the Black Death, which on its first appearance in Europe took the lives of perhaps as much as two thirds of the total population. We have now seen firsthand how life-changing living through a pandemic can be. The same was undoubtedly very much true of the Black Death outbreak in 1348, uh, especially for Jews, since we know that Jews not only lost their lives to plague, but in some places also to massacres, uh, including in Barcelona, in some places that Jews are accused of poisoning the wells or otherwise causing plague and were slaughtered in response. And it's in the wake then of the Black Death and subsequent massacres that we see a really interesting change. Uh, so in the period between about 1348 and 1350, Jewish women in Barcelona go from extending about 2% of all Jewish loans to more like 20%. And we see a rise in Girona too, which is not quite as dramatic. While there's no reason to think that more men than women died of plague, the sudden prominence of women could suggest that the attacks on the communities, these massacres, uh, could have killed more men, uh, or that since plague mortality was to some extent linked to age and husbands were often older than their wives, that the plague perhaps left an unusual number of young widows. And so these are women who usually begin by collecting on loans made by their husbands, sometimes also made loans of their own, and are uh, often in fact uh, in, uh, kind of interacting with Christian legal norms and legal cultures in really interesting ways so that there's this Christian custom that allows widows to manage their husband's estates for at least a year. And we see that this is not something that Jewish women overtly referenced before the Black Death, but suddenly we're seeing that uh, they're referencing it a lot as a, their, as a kind of reason behind their right to manage this wealth. Uh, and one final comment that I want to make on women's role in managing financial resources uh, is that this work involved not only cash, but also real property or real estate. Uh, so there's another pervasive myth that Jews in the Middle Ages are never allowed to own property. Uh, but in most places, including Catalonia, we can very see, clearly see from our documentation that Jews can buy, sell, and lease out property without restrictions. Uh, and Jewish women, in fact, play a fairly prominent role in, real, in the real estate industry. The work that Jewish women perform in other kinds of economic sectors is often much less visible to us. And this is because things like an immediate exchange of cash for goods or services wouldn't require a contract. Uh, so it would have been probably undocumented. Uh, in addition, Jews probably recorded a lot of the business that they did with other Jews in Hebrew contracts, and very, very few of these have survived. The documentation we have, however, does offer a few additional interesting glimpses into the kinds of work, uh, other kinds of work performed by Jewish women. Uh, so just as a kind of fun picture related to this, uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the textile industry which is something that we see women working in pretty much across the medieval world. Uh, and this is because skills like sewing, spinning, and weaving are skills that women often would have been expected to learn at a relatively young age at home, uh, and that women of pretty much all different social strata and of many different faiths would have done this kind of work uh, at home to produce or repair clothes for their family or even just kind of as a useful hobby. There's a, a moralist, a kind of a Christian moralist for this region who basically says something along the lines of, you know, get, get your wife to do some spinning so she passes the time doing that instead of, you know, gossiping with the neighbors. And notarial sources do provide a glimpse at least of what this work might look like in practice for Jewish women. 
uh, because we see a few contracts in which husbands and wives actually work together at complementary trades in the textile industry. Uh, so in 1318, for example, uh, I sadly don't have a photo of this document because of the uh, vagaries of archives, you know, policies in terms of what they allow you to take photographs of. But in 1318, the silk merchant, Mosa Cohen of Barcelona and his wife, Belair, a silk weaver, so another Jewish couple, uh, together bought raw silk on credit, which they described as being something they needed for the work of our trades. Uh, although we only have a few documents relating to Mosa and Belair, they give the impression of this Jewish married couple as operating a joint business in which they each had a clearly defined role so that Belair would weave raw silk into finished cloth and Mosa would sell his wife's handiwork for profit. Uh, the last kind of work that I wanted that I wanted to talk about is uh, domestic labor. So the writings of local rabbis, as well as a few examples we have of contracts, suggest that it was pretty commonplace for Jewish families to uh, outsource a lot of their domestic labor. So things like cooking, cleaning, and childcare. Uh, in poorer families, this would have been an expected part of the work that women would perform themselves for their households. Uh, but in wealthier families, that they would either hire people uh, or purchase people that they might have owned slaves. Families with infant, with infant children might also hire or purchase wet nurses, uh, so women who would breastfeed their children in place of the mother. While this custom might seem strange to us, it made a lot of sense to medieval families uh, because, first of all, people actually tended to really overtly acknowledge that breastfeeding was work in the Middle Ages, uh, but also because it required other forms of sacrifice. Uh, according to scientific theories of the time, breastfeeding women should not engage in sexual intercourse because it would spoil the milk. Uh, so because of that, couples who wanted to have sex would need to hire a wet nurse. Uh, and so one of the things that we see is that, you know, we have a few of these uh, contracts um, that refer to Jewish women kind of doing this kind of work, right, being hired as wet nurses or as domestic servants. Uh, but just to, but I want to kind of briefly mention the other kind of sources we have for this, which is a group of texts known as responsa, so questions that were sent to rabbis about thorny legal issues and their rulings. And these can be difficult to use because they often don't give a lot of details about the people involved in the case. They might omit names and use pseudonyms. They might not even tell you the exact place. But it does give a sense of uh, things that rabbis are concerned with, essentially. Uh, and they kind of talk very frequently about basically kind of challenges that arise in terms of on the one hand, there's this kind of preference that they would like for families to hire Jewish domestic servants, uh, essentially so they don't have to have non-Jews in the household. And also because if you're say a Jew hiring a Christian servant, if you're living in a place ruled by Christians, you're technically not really supposed to do that. And so it can raise problems. Um, but at the same time, they're also often concerned about uh, essentially some of the kind of everyday exploitation, uh, including sexual exploitation that happens of uh, servant women in households. So to conclude, since I want to make sure that we have some time for Q&A, uh, we see that Jewish women do face real limitations on their ability to perform certain kinds of work uh, and to be fairly remunerated for their labor. Uh, not only is this an issue of the surviving source material, but the surviving source material and its absence also reflects additional problems. And this is because contracts provide an important form of protection. So the limited number of surviving contracts for things like domestic service are not only things that are you know, frustrating for us historians who would love to have more contracts, but could also signal that Jewish women might have had a harder time being protected from unscrupulous employers uh, than people who did actually have these contracts. And we also don't know, and there's also is so much that unfortunately we don't know. We don't know the extent to which women who worked alongside their husbands and family businesses uh, would receive remuneration for that work uh, or some kind of settlement uh, if they were widowed or got divorced. Uh, what happens then to those businesses? The documentation suggests they don't necessarily consider running those businesses. Uh, so we have a lot of questions that are raised about the possibilities and the limits of women's work. But nevertheless, it is really important in my work as a historian to challenge these assumptions that medieval women had essentially all roads barred to them. Uh, 
And in particular, I hope that I have uh, demonstrated that at least some Jewish women have always worked, much like other women in the medieval world, and that we do have the documents to prove it. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. I would love to open up the floor to questions. Feel free to call out if you have a question or comment. You can also put it in the chat and I can read it out that way. Any questions from the audience? Hi, Professor I have a, a, I just have a general, by the way, if you wonder why it's pink, I'm, I'm in my granddaughter's bedroom. I'm sorry <laughs> about that, but we're visiting now. Um, my, my question is, clearly women had the ability to enter into contracts to have legal standing. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any evidence that the, the legal standing was any different for the women than if a, a man had uh, entered into the same contract? So in terms of legal standing and contracts, the answer is basically no. What the difference is, legally speaking, isn't their right to enter into a contract. It's whether they actually have the right to be doing what they're doing in the contract. So essentially, that's because um, when we're looking at women's access to an ownership of financial resources, things are all, things can be a little complicated. So most women, basically, when they get married, the wealth that they have is often in the form of a dowry. So it would be something that would be essentially basically whatever they get, but, you know, that would be all they would get in terms of an inheritance. It could be a decent amount. It may or may not be a share equal to what their brothers might get, but that the expectation would be that their husbands would manage this while they're married. So when we're talking about married women, they clearly own wealth, but they don't necessarily actually have the right to manage that wealth. So it's not that they can't enter into a contract. It's that, well, if you're entering a contract and say selling this property, do you actually have the right to sell that property without your husband's permission because it's part of your dowry? If you're, widow, if you're a widow, you can basically do whatever you would like um, in terms of, you know, if you have property, it is clearly your property and you have the right to manage that. Uh, so that, that's really what the issue is, is it's not kind of legal standing per se in terms of, you know, participating in a contract, but it's about kind of legal rights to do certain things with property. Great question. Thank you. There's a question from Suzanne in the chat. Were most women literate during this period? <clears throat> um, what, and what language did they speak at home? Maybe you can also talk generally about the role language played yeah. in all of this. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that second part first, actually. Uh, so first of all, uh, very few Jews would have been really fluent in Hebrew in this particular time and place. Hebrew is a literary language. It's a legal language. It's an intellectual language. Uh, it's not a everyday vernacular spoken language. So the language that people would have been speaking at home uh, would have been basically the, the same, that Jews would have spoken basically the same form of, you know, an early form of Catalan as the Christians living in the same city. That would have been what they spoke at home. Uh, there's some sense that there was uh, a preference for, even if they're speaking things and if they're speaking Catalan and understand Catalan, that they actually would have liked to kind of write things in Hebrew characters so that we see that there are Hebrew, that there are prayers that are written really in Catalan, transliterated into Hebrew. So using Hebrew letters, but they're Catalan words. Uh, the, the language of Ladino um, is basically that same thing and which is much more familiar to people is basically exactly that, but you know, Spanish uh, essentially kind of transliterated into Hebrew with a few kind of other words peppered in here and there. Um, but that, yeah, but that basically they would have spoken the same language as the non-Jews around them, essentially. Uh, so then on to this question of literacy. Uh, and the answer is unfortunately, probably not, uh, that this would not have been at least a highly literate population. Uh, what we kind of have a sense of essentially is that there would have been some kind of basic ability to do things like keep accounts, um, but that it's a kind of different level of literacy to keep an account book versus sit down and read a book, essentially. And that account books, yes, sitting down and reading a book, in most cases, probably not, although there would have been uh, exceptions. And uh, so that they would have then, uh, and so that that would have then been kind of part of it is that, you know, this is also a society where certainly not everybody is literate in general, um, but that they would have 
Uh, but yeah, that, that they not would not necessarily have actually been uh, been fully literate. And sorry, I got distracted actually because I saw a question related to that in the chat that I will go ahead and kind of bring up. Right? Is that uh, how could they then trust that the documents are accurate or honest? And this is actually, I think, one of the kind of interesting things about the notaries is that there seems to have been then just a lot of trust in the notaries in their capacity as public officials. Uh, because it's obviously true of, uh, you know, not just Jewish women, but, you know, a lot of Christian women would not necessarily have been literate. And for that matter, a lot of Christian or Jewish men are not necessarily fully literate, uh, that we're still in a period where, you know, there would be people, especially poorer people who are not literate and also who don't necessarily know Latin exactly, right? So keeping in mind, right, that these documents that I'm, that I'm looking at are contracts written in Latin. And you can probably figure out some of it if you speak Catalan because it's a romance language. So, you know, you can figure out, you know, you know, everybody can kind of figure out what the word debeo means, I-O. Uh, if, you, if you speak Catalan, you can figure out that Latin pretty easily. But that to some extent it is uh, something of a trust that if the notary probably basically would have been kind of reading back to you a kind of on the spot translation into the Catalan vernacular uh, and, you know, to kind of make sure that you all agree on what the document says. Uh, but yeah, but there is a lot of trust involved essentially in these public officials that they're actually writing down what they're supposed to be writing down. Great questions. Fascinating stuff. Any other questions? Or reactions, reflections? Yeah, Hal? Don't forget to unmute, yeah. Uh, just one comment, it's just fascinating to to listen to someone who has studied, researched uh, things that took place hundreds of years ago. It's just always amazing to hear historians and professors speak about such, such, such subjects. So I just want to commend you on, um, on all that you've accomplished and, and researched. How long have you studied the topics that, that you've talked about today? So actually going back to, uh, let's say 2008, uh, so about, Kind of coming up on 15 years uh, that actually my interest in some of this material actually started with research for my undergraduate thesis um, that I was able to go and spend a summer in Girona doing some of uh, some kind and starting to work with these sources. And I really, you know, the pro this project that I am working on now or the book that's going to be published in September, uh, which was my dissertation, which is my doctoral dissertation or the, you know, is the book based on my doctoral dissertation, I really was so fascinated, kind of came to that project in part because when I did my undergraduate thesis uh, and was kind of thrown by an advisor into these sources, I really just became so fascinated with the extent to which you could uncover the everyday lives of ordinary people in a way that it, honestly, had, had, I'd been interested in medieval history, but it hadn't occurred to me that you could do that with medieval history. Uh, I thought you could only get that level of detail with, you know, elites. So seeing that you can do that with these kinds of sources was really just so fascinating to me and really was what then kind of led me to, uh, to kind of keep pursuing uh, this work and these topics. Thank you. Great question, Hal. I would love to know what your next research horizons and topics look like. What, what's coming up for you? Yeah, so uh, I actually have two new projects that I'm going to be working on. Uh, one is going to be working with similar kinds of sources. Uh, and thinking about uh, basically the kind of ways in which we're seeing Jews uh, engage uh, with uh, Christian legal systems, especially in things like family law, so things like marriage and inheritance and divorce, because these are areas where officially the Jewish community has the right to kind of fully govern themselves, right? They can decide what, they, what they're going to do. There's no legal reason technically for them to need anything but Hebrew contracts. And yet sometimes we see these marriage contracts and divorce contracts and wills showing up in Latin that Jews are doing with, the, with these Christian notaries. Uh, so I'm going to be thinking about essentially just kind of what's, what's going on there and what that tells us um, about kind of Jewish identity and uh, kind of thinking as well about how that changes uh, after there are these massacres in 1391 after which there's also a mass conversion of Jews. So thinking about then basically what, what happens when actually because of that process, you end up with a lot of mixed Jewish Christian families. Uh, and so how then we're seeing those families using the notaries and so uh, kind of taking those parts together. Uh, and the other thing is that I'm actually going to be working on something uh, kind of thinking about the, uh, 
intersections between gender and anti-Judaism. So in a lot of the kind of rhetoric surrounding um, basically kind of Christian nasty rhetoric about Jews, uh, what are the ways in which gender is factoring into this? Uh, so that's the other project on the horizon. Wow, well, I look forward to hearing about those in next year's faculty lecture when we hopefully have you back. Um, there's a great question in the chat. In, in doing this research, do you engage local scholars to read it for you or do you read Latin fluently yourself? I do read Latin fluently myself, yes. And I will say that uh, medieval studies in particular is a very language heavy field. So my primary text, the documents that I read directly um, are a lot of the ones you looked at for today are in Latin, which I read fluently. Uh, I read Hebrew as well. So I talked a little bit at the end about uh, some of the rabbinic sources and relatively few of the ones I'm looking at have been translated. So I read those in Hebrew as well. Uh, and also you, uh, you really need to also think about languages that you need to read the work of other scholars and to engage with that scholarly community. Uh, so, and that means in this particular region, it means both Spanish and Catalan, which is uh, really is a separate language. Um, and uh, you also, you get a lot of brownie points in Catalonia for uh, being an American who actually bothered to learn Catalan, uh, which is, you know, so it means the archivists like you more, the other scholars like you more. Sometimes, you know, somebody will give you some free food. Um, uh, so that really, you know, you, you spend a lot of time working with a lot of languages uh, in, in history in general, and I would say in medieval history in particular. Wow. If I wasn't impressed with you already, now I am like a, a, especially impressed with all of your language skills on top of everything else that you do. That's amazing. Um, we have a couple more minutes before we have to let Professor Ift Decker go to actually teach a class with our Rhodes students. Do we have any final comments or questions before I tell you about next month's lecture and then let you go. I have a yeah, quick Hattie. curiosity question. Uh, what you said about using Hebrew letters, mm -hmm. making sounds in the Catalan language, first time I ever heard about that. And am, am I stretching it too far to draw a similarity between that and Yiddish and German and Polish and so forth, or is it the same yeah. sort of thing? Yeah, you're not stretching that at all. It's uh, it's actually a really common phenomenon that we see basically all over the Jewish world in the Middle Ages, that that's very much what Yiddish is. Uh, if we look at the Middle East, we also know that a lot of documents that we have are written in what we refer to as Judeo-Arabic, which is basically Arabic just written in Hebrew in the Hebrew alphabet. But yeah, this is this is really, really common in a lot of places. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. You know, yeah. my, my own personal experience goes only to Yiddish. I didn't realize there were parallels in other mm -hmm. parts of Europe and the world. Thank you. Yeah. Amazing. Um, one last quick question or a couple questions. What courses are you teaching and what has your experience been like at Rhodes so far? Yeah, so I'll, I'm going to take the second. Uh, so I'm going to I'll sort of take them both at once, actually, or I'll try to. Uh, so this is only my uh, my second year at Rhodes, though it, uh, it feels like it must have been longer. Um, but uh, I, first of all, I've been so impressed with how engaged the students have been. And in particular that I've uh, really found it interesting in terms of actually having a lot of students in classes that have focused on Jewish history in particular, uh, that have actually brought in a lot of, uh, a number of Jewish students, but also a lot of non-Jewish students. Uh, and to have been, you know, really kind of willing to engage on some questions that they, they haven't necessarily thought about before. And so, you know, I've, I really have been kind of so impressed in that regard, uh, even with, of course, the challenges of starting a new position during a pandemic. Um, and uh, so now I'm actually, I'm, uh, I'm about to go teach a uh, Jewish history up to the year 1500 survey. Uh, today, we're actually up to uh, talking about the Crusades and the impact that those had on, uh, on Jewish communities, both in Europe and in the Middle East. Uh, so I'm doing that. Uh, I also teach in the search program. Uh, so, and I, I did that this morning. I'm actually uh, coming to right between those two classes. Uh, and this semester, I'm also teaching a, uh, a history course uh, that is uh, a kind of an intro level history course, which is called Medieval at the Movies. Um, which is not focused on Jewish history in particular, but which looks at uh, basically perceptions of the medieval world as seen through modern films. Uh, so we, uh, we watch a kind of really interesting variety of things. You know, we've done Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, 
uh, is kind of always a big favorite. Uh, we've done Braveheart. Um, uh, we are going to be, you know, watching the new uh, the new Green Knight movie in, in a few weeks. Uh, so uh, it's and that's really been a lot of fun as well in terms of uh, seeing students that uh, kind of bringing together students with more film backgrounds versus students with history backgrounds and seeing them grapple with these different kinds of sources. Amazing. Well, I want to audit all of your classes officially. <laughs> Sign me up. Um, thank you so much, Professor Ifta Decker, for being here. Thank you, everyone, for learning, for showing up and learning with us today. A quick plug for our next faculty lecture and our final lecture of the semester, actually, is with Professor Marina Lavina from University of Memphis. She's a professor of communication and very involved in their film um, studies program there. That'll be on Friday, April 8th from 12 to one right back here on Zoom. So I will be sending more information out about that. And in the meantime, I hope everyone stays healthy and safe, especially with this impending snow. Um, so stay safe and warm and have a great weekend. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Professor.